Bruchem Aboim. Thank you for coming. The lecture today, we were, we've been talking about stories, and we've discussed uh, stories and their importance, and also that God, in his Torah, tells us stories so that we can learn by their message. Uh, we read stories about people and about things, things that give us guidance and inspiration. So the last three lectures that I've given were on a story that I had written. Uh, a story doesn't have to be true to be inspirational. It was fictitious. But tonight, what I want to do is discuss another point about stories. There's a prayer that we say called Modim, where we bow in the standing prayer. And in that prayer, it says the words in Hebrew, which translates, A, that I will thank you. Modim, again, means thank you. But I will thank you, and I will tell others about your praise. It's an interesting thing when we think of God. You hear people complaining about God all the time. God, why, how can he do this? How can he do that? But people find it difficult to praise God when things are good. So the words in this that I just quoted, know the lacha, we know that part of the reason we're called Jews, Yehuda, is because of the fact that Leah thanked God for the fourth son, which was over her portion. So the word Yehuda, Jew, really deals with the whole concept of saying thank you. But even if we say thank you, if we don't tell people about it, then we've missed the boat. So it's not just an obligation to thank God, no de lecha, but also in the saper tehilasecha. I will tell other people the stories that have happened to me, the good things, not just the things I'm concerned about or the misery that I think I'm gone through, but those things that are very obviously the hand of God. So what I want to do tonight is tell a story that was published in the Jewish press years back. It's part of a book now called Homeward Bound by Michael Gross. And the story's about my mother-in-law. And what she did was, through her, God showed me an answer to a question that we all have. Where's God and how do we understand what he does? And it's very difficult to do and sometimes it's puzzling. Sometimes it looks like it's off the wall. So let me tell you the story. When my wife and I got married, I had um, been religious up until the age of 15 and then left, totally left. I didn't want to be religious. I knew what it was. And I tried to find something else. My wife and I got married. I was uh, 23. She was 21. And um, my wife came from a very secular family. They really didn't keep much of anything. And... Interestingly enough, she only went out with Jewish guys, which wasn't, I can't say the same about women. But she, they had that, for some reason, that was part of their thing. And not only that, the family had moved away from religion because of certain tragedies that had happened. And uh, my mother-in-law's parents, uh, who had had some religion, had totally divorced themselves from it. So she grew up really without any religion at all. And so when we got married, it was a very secular thing. In fact, that probably more of an accident to my wife who's Jewish, not something I was really looking for. Anyways, years later, when my son was born, and that would have been, I guess, six years into our, not nine years into our marriage, and um, which was kind of a, we waited six years for him to be born. We thought we wouldn't have any more children before we put him for adoption. And uh, when he was born is when I became a Balchuba. I walked out of the living room and that I wanted to thank God, and that's why I did it. So that's a story within itself. But that's not the story of my mother-in-law. So my wife and I made the return back. For her, it was new. For me, it was a return to Judaism. And she embraced it, and we went down that path, thankfully. And it was totally different somehow as an adult and coming back. I saw it totally different. And I guess my mother-in-law was watching this transformation of the secular me into the religious me. And unbeknownst to me, and quite to my amazement, my mother-in-law started to light Shabbos candles. And when I heard that she was lighting Shabbos candles, I was amazed. 
and quite impressed. Anyways, it's not like she kept Shabbos necessarily. She would, she had a business that she ran out of her basement. There was a doorway, an entrance from the street. <clears throat> and she would see customers even on Friday, Friday night. And so one Friday night, she lights her Shabbos candles and goes downstairs and takes care of some business with a customer. And when she comes upstairs, her whole kitchen is ablaze. It's on fire. And she calls us up after Shabbos and tells us the story. Her kitchen was on fire, smoke damage. And I'm really kind of confused. I'm kind of having a discussion in myself, even though I tell her, well, you know, Ma, you'll get insurance, you know, and you'll have a nicer kitchen, and, you know, it'll wind up being better. But in my heart of hearts, I have this conversation kind of with God, and I, I kind of say to, my, to him, let me get this straight. I get her to light Shabbos candles. You burn down her kitchen. It doesn't make sense. She should have won the lottery. You know, something fantastic should have happened to encourage her to continue to light and show the beauty of what it is to serve God. Instead, God burns down her kitchen, almost her house. And to my amazement, the next, shot, the next week we, I call her and I talk to her and, you know, she's having trouble with the insurance, but they finally settled that up. But she continues to light Shabbos candles, <laughs> which I don't know that I would have done that. Of course, she lights them in the sink, but she lights them. And I'm in awe. I just can't believe it. And so I just finally just put my hands up in the air and kind of said to God, Gamzul Latov, everything's for the best. And I believe in the saying, Olam Chesed Yibana, the world was created for kindness. And even though I don't understand, somehow, some way, this has to be for good. And I just filed it under question mark and my hard drive. Sometime later, she had hired a contractor, was redoing her house, the kitchen, the smoke damage. And I think all of us have in our house things that are broken, things that need fixing. In fact, the only time we do that is when we move. And by then, we don't want to move because now everything's working. But we all have little things, and we don't want to bring a contractor in for this, that, and the other. It's way too expensive and a hassle. But once we have a contractor in the house, then all those little things we tell him about, and he loves it because he can charge us full price. It works for him. It works for us. We get it done. So when my in-laws had bought their house, they had a two-family house, and they liked a big master suite. So what they had done was taken a wall down between two bedrooms and had a, expanded the bedroom into a nice master suite, very impressive, very nice, very comfortable. But a few years had passed, and when she had this contractor in the house, she had noticed that a crack had developed in the ceiling, and she asked him to go in and give her a price on how much it would be to replaster the ceiling and paint it. Simple. So he says, sure. He comes back very quickly. His face is ashen. And he looks at her and he says, I don't know who did that work for you, but he did a lousy job because you see that wall was like a bearing wall and your bed is right over that crack and the whole upstairs the ceiling is getting ready to cave in and he says to her if you're in bed when that comes down it will kill you so she called us and told us and as you can imagine it put a big smile on my face because it doesn't usually happen but God lifted the curtain God allowed me to see the full picture, not just the part with the fire, but the reason for the fire. The woman had done a great mitzvah of lighting Shabbos candles, and that fire was enough merit for her to save her life. And this is what we have to believe and know in everything and anything that we do. Someone this week, before I was going to tell the story, told me about a chandelier that their house had water damage. And it was just a drip. And uh, so they decided to put a new chandelier in. And she told me that when they did that, they found out that the person who had wired the chandelier initially, the wires were frayed. And it could have easily set off a fire. 
There's so many things like this, and there's so many stories. God's there trying to open our eyes. But much like Hugger, with the story of Yishmael, when she thought she had no water, the, the well was there all the time. God always has salvation for us. All we need to do is open our eyes. And if we open our eyes, the miracles around, around us are endless. But the important thing is, is not just that God does something good and we say thank you. The important thing is tell people. You know, we as Jews are so embarrassed to say thank you to God and to use his name. You'll watch a prize fight and when it's over, when the announcer tries to interview the winner, he won't say a word until he thanks his God of whatever it might be. That's important to him. He acknowledges that. Someone in the middle of a, catches a pass in the end zone, step, lay, puts step one knee down and says a prayer, looks up to heaven. We're embarrassed as Jews. We, God's chosen people, God's firstborn, we're afraid to say thank you and mention his name to people. I make it a point not to end, to end every sentence, every time I talk to people, with God bless. And it's interesting, it stuns some people. Some people it puts a smile on. But I really don't care. It's just something I need to do. It's something I need to acknowledge how good God has been to me. And good, good he is to everyone. And it's interesting. It starts to get contagious. People around me start to say it. And I notice people who didn't say it or felt uncomfortable now ending their conversation to me with the words, God bless. So make it a point. Not just to thank God. Tell stories. Tell the stories of the goodness of those things that worked for you where you realize you see the hand of God and how evident it is. Because what we do is we complain a lot. And our complaints are loud. In fact, that's one of the things that leaders, religious leaders, complain about. That people come to them all the time with problems. We go to a, what we call a Rebbe, a spiritual leader, for a bracha. We ask him to give us a blessing. We feel he has a conduit to heaven. He's got an inside road for us to help to get there. We ask him for a blessing. We pour our hearts out of needs that we have. And the interesting thing is, we're in such a hurry to come see him when we need something. But when it works, very few people come back or let him know about the good that was done. They're there for the bad, not to give him the joy of knowing. Because even a Rebbe needs to know that God's listening as well and that God's allowing him to be that messenger of good tidings and of connection to heaven. So again, always remember, not just to thank God in your heart, but put it on your lips and tell everyone and anyone you know. Be, be, push it. Let people know. Don't be embarrassed. And with that, you'll get other people to do the same. And people will realize there's a God in the world and that he loves us and all he wants to do is be relevant. And this is the way that we make him more relevant. And this is the way we fulfill our job in this world, which is giving God a dira betaktonim, a dwelling place in this lowest of worlds where God wants to reside with us, in us, and to be a part of us. May God bless you all, and may you have many stories that you realize that you have to tell people. Thank you. God bless, and have a good Shabbos.